said? Amen. That's good singing tonight. Brother Mark, why don't you come and pray for us tonight. If you'd just come all the way up here, please. And Brother Mark's a missionary. We'll have him in one of these days. He's just here visiting with us tonight, he and his wife, and we appreciate him being here. Pray for us, dear sir. We're glad to have you. Appreciate it. God bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for such a good place to be in your house on this day. God, we thank you for God's people, Lord, for these songs of heaven. Yes. God, I pray that it would focus our hearts on the night yes. and what lays ahead of us. Lord, we thank you for your word, yes. for the men that preach it. And God, we thank you for this missionary. Oh, God, I pray that you'll help him tonight as he goes over his field. Lord, we pray that you'll bless the preaching also. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. All right, choir. Let's stand again. Turn to page 185. Page 185. We'll sing My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me. My Savior could heal me. Yeah. 
playing the choir's coming down we'd like you to turn around and shake hands with those around you if you would please fellowship one with the other Thank you for coming to church tonight. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for coming. You folks that drove some distance to be with us tonight, thank you folks for being here. Folks visiting with us from different places, we appreciate you being here. appreciate our folks being faithful tonight. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do because we're doing things a little bit different tonight so you'll know. And that way you ladies know when it's time to put your shoes back on. All right. <laughs> we're, going, <laughs> we're going to have prayer for our military here in just a moment. Uh, we're up and down a lot, aren't we? I had a, I, one of the men that visited a few weeks ago, he said, if I knew all this, I'd brought my lift chair with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to take our evening offering. And the reason I mention this ahead of time is after we take our evening offering, we're going to the children's offering for our missionary, for our missionary and his family visiting with us at Johnston's tonight. Haiti for 16 years. God's used them there. And I want you to give tonight, and we're going to give that to them tonight. So if you wish to give some money when the children take up the offering, I want you to be able to do that. And then Brother Johnson and his family is going to come and show the slides. And then he and his wife's going to sing for us. And then he's going to preach for us. Then we're going to give an invitation. And you're going to respond. Amen. We're, going to we're going to baptize. Amen. Amen. Tell him I got saved this morning. He's getting baptized. 
And then we're going to have closing remarks. And what that means, we'll find something to remark about before we get there. I want you to know, because we're changing things around, I want you to enjoy what God's done for us. There was a lady saved at the Hispanic services this afternoon. That's wonderful. Amen. One more time, we're going to pray for our military and for our leaders. Brother H.B. Carney is going to come and pray for our military and our leaders. I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have and for the freedom that we have to come here to worship this evening. And, Father, it's because of you and because of our country, Lord, that we have this. And, Lord, we ask that you would be with our military as they're there on the foreign field and on the foreign soils. Lord, we ask that you'd be with them in a special way today. And, Lord, uh, that one that uh, needs you the most, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, put your loving arms around that person today and help them in a special way. And, Father, we pray for our presidents. We pray for our uh, people that are in... Uh, control and in over our country, Lord, we ask that you give them wisdom, Lord, that they need, and the wisdom that can only come from you, Lord, we ask that you'd give that to them. And Lord, once again, we want to tell you that we love you. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ, for that yes. precious blood that was shed, for the salvation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we just ask you to have your way in the service tonight and speak to that soul that's nearest hell now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother H.B. You may be seated. If our men, young men will come this evening, we'll receive the offering. Robert, you want to come up and ask the Lord to bless the offering, please, at this time. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for the stage you've given us, Lord, and we thank you for allowing us the privilege to be in your house tonight, Lord. I pray now that you would be with Brother Johnson, Lord. Help him and use him, Lord, now in this hour, Lord. I pray that you would be with this offering, Lord. Help it to go to your honor and your glory. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Robert. May the Lord bless as we give tonight. If the children have some money they want to place in the mission offering, they can do so at this time. So, boys and girls, if you'd come and if you have some money, as the preacher's already reminded us this evening, where the money's going, if you have some money you'd like to give to the Johnston family, if you'll just hold it way up high and our boys and girls will come by and pick it up. And, boys and girls, if you have a scripture verse you want to say tonight or a song you want to sing, we'll let you do that. You can just stay up here. So you come at this time. A lot of folks over here, boys and girls. All right, good. Just hold it up high and wave it at them. They'll be by and pick it up. Thank you, ladies. Joshua, are you ready? First John 419, we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Good job, Brandon. Romans 323, for all have seen and come short to the glory of God. Amen. Good job, fellas. Okay, girls. Scoot over just a little bit. I can't get remember. You can't remember. She don't say it's really. Uh 
kiss was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, and he didn't want to see. And that's a savior, that's the way he looked up in the tree. And he said, the kid, you come down from there. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. Amen. Good job. Here. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to hear me long. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Good job. Amen. Sing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas one, but now I see. Jesus, I don't know remember. You don't remember it? Okay, you gonna try again next week? All right. Call us unto me and all Jeremiah thirty three three. Call us unto me and I'll answer thee of the great many things I know is not. Amen, amen. Let's give them all a big hand tonight. And good job as always. Children may be dismissed to go downstairs to their class at this time. Two through five years of age can be dismissed. Preacher, a good crowd here tonight. Yes. Amen. Thank you folks appreciate for coming. coming. God bless you. Being faithful in the summertime, we appreciate that. We're ready for our missionary, aren't we? You, you folks need to get somewhere where you can see. You're going to sing first or show the slides first? You're going to sing first? 1982, 83. Is that when I first? 83. I was teaching, uh, I was pastor here, but I was traveling to Peoria, Illinois, teaching some cl classes at the Bible school. That's when I first met Brother Johnston and his wife, and uh, they've been precious, and we've been supporting them for 16 years. I'm thankful for that. Brother Johnston, you come, introduce your wife, your daughter, and sing for us, and then we'll get ready for you to show your slides, all right? Thank you for being here. Yeah, there's two. Uh, hers will work if you turn around here. This one or that one? Hers? Yeah, she's the one that makes it sound good. You might want to turn this one down a little bit, please. Amen? And turn her up. I was saved on April 11, 1982. I'll never forget the day. I'll never forget the place. I'll never forget for what he done for me. He took me to Calvary, and he washed me whiter than snow. wasn't ready to die, but then I met the Savior, what a friend, Lord, to know, for He took me to Calvary, washed me whiter than snow. Now I'm saved, yes, I'm saved by His marvel. child of that heavenly race. Now my heart is full of gladness and my life is all alone. For he took me to Calvary, washed me water and snow. Now I don't have much money. Thing that's for certain Jesus knows 
While they're sitting down, I'll say this. I do want you to see what your faith promised missions has done. We, God allowed us to go to Haiti. We landed in April of 90. We've been there almost 16 years. God's allowed us to start 18 independent fundamental Baptist churches. Over 5,000 souls sitting in church tonight in between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And every soul that's been saved has been added to your account. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 17. He said, not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And every soul that's been saved has been added to your account. So tonight when you see the slides, I want you to look at it from a different perspective. This is your ministry as much as it is mine, but ultimately it's God's ministry. Amen? But he's put us together as a team so every soul that's been saved has been added to your account the Johnstons, missionaries to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. We're sent out by Grace Bible Baptist Church in Great Castle, Missouri. Our pastor is Pastor Earl Baker, and I praise the Lord for a pastor who has a love for lost souls, not only in America, but around the world. The word Haiti means the land of mountains, and as you can see, it lives up to its name. It's a very rough, rugged terrain. We lived back in the village of Salankari, but our first ministry was back in the village of Kabule, an hour and a half walk over three mountain ranges. But I praise the Lord for the church that's been established there. This is now an indigenous work, self-governing, self-supporting, self-propagating ministry. This church has gone out and started two new churches on their own, and we praise the Lord for the lighthouse in Kabule. This is the church at Savankari. When we started here, we didn't have a large group of people, but it wasn't long that God had blessed, and we were running over 350 people each and every service. This church has a large Christian school of over 400 students, which we praise the Lord because every year we see over 100 of these young children come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. This is the ministry of Monsal. We just went up to Monsal and started preaching. And it wasn't long that God had blessed. We've seen souls saved. The people went out and bought a piece of property on top of the mountain and built what they call a toenail, which is just bamboo poles with palm leaves woven together over it. And we had some great services there. I thank God that it's not the building that makes the church, but it's the people that reside within that building. This is the ministry of Kamat. 
This church, when we went there, was just a small nucleus of people, but God blessed, and it wasn't long. We had organized the ministry. This is the organizational service. And we praise the Lord for the church at Kaimont and how God is blessing and souls are being saved. This church is now running over 400 people each and every service. This is the ministry of Platana. We went to Platana, scouted out the land. God sent us there, and all anything that we found was a Christian church, and the pastor of that Christian church was a witch doctor. So we went out on visitation and started visiting the area, and in our first service, we had over 400 people. We didn't have any benches, we didn't have any pews, but God blessed people came and sat on the ground to hear the preaching of God's Word. We've seen many, many people saved, and this ministry is a lighthouse to the community of Platana. This is the ministry of Liret. We just went up there, started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it wasn't long God had given us a nucleus of people. And we praise the Lord for this ministry at Liret, and the souls that's been saved, and the lighthouse that it is in the zone, and the work that's being done through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the ministry of La Riviere. We went to this little village, started visiting from house to house and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't long God had given us a nucleus of people and now this ministry is flourishing in the area of La Riviere. This is the ministry of Tube. We went to this area here, started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, went out soul winning, and God blessed. It wasn't long that God had given us a nucleus of people. We built a little building here and some benches, and uh, the church is just flourishing. We praise the Lord for the work that's being done there, the souls that's been saved. Thankful for the man that God's given us to continue the work there and to continue preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the church at Quad Bouquet. When we started at Quad Bouquet, we just went to somebody's house, asked if we could use the room in the home, and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God began to bless. And this is the ministry that exists today through the preaching and the soul winning in the area of Quad Bouquet. This church now has about 200 students in the Christian school. We praise the Lord for this ministry. This is the ministry of Bala. We went to Bala, a very desolate area. These people had no hope. They had no future. They had religion in the zone, but they didn't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We went out and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I remember the first service. Twenty-nine souls were saved in the first service. But God continued to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we could not even imagine. This ministry now is running well over 200 people. So we praise the Lord for the work in Bala. This is the ministry of Timashi. We went to the area there, started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God began to bless, and we've seen more souls come to know Christ each and every day. Pray for this ministry. This ministry has gone through many valleys, many hard times, but yet they've been faithful and true to the Word of God and faithful to the Lord. This is our first ministry in the Dominican Republic. This is the zone of Bate Santoral. We just went to the area, started sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God began to bless in a mighty way. As we shared and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, souls began to be saved. The first lady that was saved, her name was Alta Gracia, and she allowed us to meet in her yard, and it wasn't long that God had given us a nucleus of people. But before long, God gave us a piece of property, and we built what's called an anga on that piece of property. We met here for almost a year, and God began to bless, and more souls were saved. And then, before long, God opened the door that we could build this building here, and we praise the Lord for the work that God has done in this area. This church is now running 250 people each and every Every service. We praise the Lord for the work that He's done in the area of Barona. This is the ministry of Bate Cinco. This is one of the poorest areas in the Dominican Republic where the Haitians live. But even though they have poverty, the greatest need that they have is Jesus Christ. We went out, done some soul winning and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it wasn't long that many souls have been saved and lives had been changed. And we praise the Lord for the church that's been planted there. God truly blessed. He gave us a piece of property. We went out and built a church on that property, made it out of bark off of coconut trees, cut down the trees, split the bark, made the siding, put it tin roof on it and God blessed we've seen many many souls saved in this facility but in 1998 Hurricane George came through and destroyed this facility and this is the facility that God has given us today we praise the Lord for the church in Bate Cinco in May of 2004 our pastor came and we organized the church in Bate Cinco and we praise the Lord for the lighthouse that's been planted in Bate Cinco this is the town of Gonaives Haiti it's the third largest city in the country with over 200,000 people. 
God sent us here to start a church. We went out and done some soul winning, preaching and teaching, and God blessed. And the little building that you see is where the church is now meeting. This is the ministry of Vicente Noble, Dominican Republic. This is the newest church that we've started. We praise the Lord for the people that's been saved, the lives that's been changed. Pray for this work as God continues to bless, and we see more and more people come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. This is the most rewarding ministry that we have. This is the Bible Institute. We have 63 students in the Bible Institute, and here I'm teaching the class of theology. God has given us the privilege to train men like Jean Aubert and Siedonne, Ones, and Lysis Wossier. Lysis Wossier is the first graduate from the Bible Institute on the Dominican side of the border. And Lysis Wossier is now the pastor of the church of Barona. This is the most exciting ministry that we have in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. This is our evangelistic teams. Each week we go out to an area where we've never been, do some soul winning, set up the benches, and do some preaching. We've seen many, many souls saved through this ministry. And we praise the Lord for the evangelistic teams that go out and preach each and every week. This is one of the ministries that's been started due to the evangelistic teams. This is Bate 8, one of our newest churches. We praise the Lord for the ministry there, the souls that's been saved, and the lives that have been changed. This church is now running 45 people each and every service. I praise the Lord for people that have a love for lost souls. This is what we feel is the future of the ministry. We're asking God to allow us to build a 200-bed dormitory that we might train men both from Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Please pray with us that God would supply the needed funds to finish the first phase of the project. We already have over 100 students from Haiti and over 100 students from the Dominican Republic just waiting to start in the Bible College, but we have no place to put them. We must realize that the future of the ministry is not Bob Johnston, but it's the Haitian people reaching the Haitian people. You say, how is this all possible? It was through the preaching of God's Word, through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was through going, going out and witnessing every day on the mountainside, sharing with the people the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I thank God that it's not just me, but those that have been saved have a burden to see their people come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Many of these young people have given their lives to the Lord and now are in full-time ministry. And we praise the Lord for these young people that are out witnessing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the message might go forth. Because the future of the ministry is not Bob Johnston, but the future of the ministry are the Haitian people reaching the Haitian people. Like Papa Sekont. Papa Sekont was blind physically, but now he sees spiritually. Pray for us that God would continue to bless, that we could see more and more souls come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Pray for these people, because the only hope that they have is Jesus Christ. Storms of life to say, I know just who I'll turn to, and I know he'll never fail. But I don't know how they make it, but that the Lord brought him by their side. I don't know how they take it when the tears fall from their eyes. Friend, I just don't understand it. Jesus means the world to me. It all seems strange to see. I don't know how they make it. Oh, friend, I just don't understand it. Jesus means the world to me. It all seems strange to see. You may never meet a Haitian this side of glory, but one day you're going to walk down the streets of gold and a Haitian's going to walk up to you 
And he's going to say, Merci beaucoup pour tout ça que tu as fait. Parce qu'on joue, tu vois un missionnaire qui te prêche la parole de bon Dieu. Et pour la première fois, je t'ai de la vérité. Je t'ai accepté Jésus-Christ comme sauveur moi personnellement. Et pour être la foi de nous-mêmes, je vais avec vous pour toujours et toujours. Merci beaucoup. What he said was this. Thank you so very much because one day by faith, you sent a missionary to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the first time in my life, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And because of your faith, I'll spend eternity in heaven. One of our men said, Preacher, tell them thank you. Amen. Tell them thank you. And church, I want to thank you. First of all, for your faithfulness in prayer. And secondly, for your faithfulness in finances. But most of all, for your vision. Amen? For your vision for the world. Because without a vision, the people will perish. Amen? Take your Bible, if you would, and open it up to Acts chapter 14 this evening. Acts chapter 14. Amen? Acts chapter 14. And I'd ask you to stand for the reading of God's word this evening. Acts chapter 14, we'll start in verse number 19. Acts chapter 14, verse number 19. Amen. I love hearing the turning of God's, the pages of God's book. Amen. The Bible says this. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him outside the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit his disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed uh, with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium, to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Father, we love you, and God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather around the throne of grace tonight. Father, this would just be a meeting without you, so God, tonight, we ask ask you, God, to permeate this place with your presence, your power. And Father, may the Holy Spirit have liberty. And Father, may the Son have the, uh, be able to work as he desires to work in our hearts and our lives. And God will praise you for the victories. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we look at this portion of Scripture tonight, I just kind of want to reiterate the verses before that. Paul has gone to Iconium and is preaching a great revival. Many souls have been saved. Many lives have been changed. You know, what to God they could say about us what they said about the Apostle Paul, that the crowd was divided. Half the crowd was for him. Half the crowd was against him. Would to God that half of Oliver Springs, uh, Tennessee, and the surrounding communities were for you. Amen? And the other half was against you. It seems like we don't do what Paul could do. Amen? But we have the same God, we have the same power and we have the same ability and we have the same preserved word of God. Though Paul wrote much of it, it was still preserved in the heart of Paul. Amen? And I thank God for the preserved word of God. Therefore, we need to realize that when we're going to do a work for God, we just got to put it in God's hand and let God do the work. Amen? Let God do the work. And Paul done that. But you know, when you're doing a work for God, there's always the skeptics. There's always the crowd that rises up against you. Normally, it's religious crowd. The world doesn't seem to matter much, but the religious crowd will always try to hinder you from doing what God wants you to do. And the sad part is, a lot of times, it's within the church. Amen? It's within the church. We need to realize that we are a team. Amen? And a team needs to be unified in their goals in life. You know, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, in verse number 10, that the church there, uh, that the Philippian church lacked opportunity. And they sought that opportunity. We need to be seeking the opportunity opportunities to serve the Lord. We need to be seeking them. Why? Because the time is coming when we're going to go through some valleys and we're going to need each other. We're going to have to have the strength of each other to withstand the battles of this old world. And Paul has come to that point in his life. Here Paul has the disciples with him. Here Paul is preaching the gospel, but the crowd has risen up against him. And what does Paul do? Turn over with me if you would. Uh, uh, well, no, you don't have to turn. Just my Bible, amen? To verse number 20, amen? <laughs> Maybe yours is on the same page. In verse number 20, the Bible says this. How be it, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now Paul had just been stoned drug outside the city and left for dead. Now Paul is in a real predicament here in the sense that Paul can make a decision for God or against God. Folks, we need to make a decision that we are going to stand for God. Like David's mighty men, they def uh, one of David's mighty men defended a, a pea patch, man, the little patch. It wasn't his, but it was his to defend. And he defended it with his life. Folks, God's given us a piece of land and we need to defend that piece of land with our life. I've decided in my life 
life that God says to fight and after we fight to keep fighting. He says stand and to keep standing. That, the Bible says we're going to fight. The Bible doesn't say we're going to win every battle. Now the victory's been won. I'm not fighting for the victory. I'm fighting from the victory. Amen? Because Jesus won the victory on Calvary. But in the battles of everyday life, we don't win them all. But I've decided, I've determined in my life, I'm standing my ground. I would rather Jesus come and I have footprints over my back where they walked over me than give up the piece of ground that he's given me to guard. Amen? Therefore, Paul had a decision he had to make. Paul, there was three things that Paul did that turned the ministry around. Three things that Paul did that preserved uh, the life of Christianity, if you would please. We're sitting here because of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you've ever heard me preach, you'll know that the Apostle Paul is my hero. Outside the Lord Jesus Christ, no one's ever done more for the cause of Christ outside of the Apostle Paul. He wrote more of the New Testament. He started more churches. He preached in more areas and he has affected more lives to this very day than the other apostles. But yet everyone had their importance. Everyone had their ministry. But now Paul has been stoned and drugged outside the city and left for dead. And then it says here, how be the disciples stood round about him. Can you imagine what these disciples were going through as they stood round about him? Here they may have been discouraged, distraught, because here's Paul, the one that they loved. Here's Paul, the one that had nurtured them. Here's Paul, the one that had lifted them up and carried them through the hard times. And he's laying down here, and maybe in their mind they're thinking, how can this be? They took Christ. They took and crucified him on a cross, and not again, not Paul too. Maybe they become a little discouraged, a little distraught. But here the apostle Paul, he rose up, Folks, we need to rise up over the problems of life. Why do we need to rise up? First of all, we need to rise up for each other, amen, for the cause of Christ. We need to rise up to strengthen each other. Then we need to rise up for the souls. Paul said, Paul rose up for the souls, those souls that stood round about him, those disciples that was discouraged. He rose up and in those that were in the city that he'd been preaching to, they needed to see that it was worth living for. Would to God that they could see that our, our, our gospel is worth living for. Amen. Many a times we claim to be Christians, but our gospel that we preach with our life is different from the gospel that we preach from this book. It should be consistent. It should be consistent. We should have only one testimony, only one word, only one witness. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. Amen. That's the key. Jesus Christ. Paul rose up. He rose up for the disciples. He rose up for the souls uh, that were in Iconium. But then he rose up thirdly for the skeptics. You know, there's that crowd that's always looking around. There's that crowd that's always just waiting to see if you're going to make it. Amen. I remember when we first went to Haiti. I'll never forget this. Our first six weeks in Haiti, God tried us. God tried us our first six weeks. I had malaria, dysentery, food poisoning. My son laying in the, beside the bed. Preacher, I went to Haiti weighing 277, and in six weeks I weighed 215. Great diet, but I don't recommend it. Amen. And my wife had malaria trying to take care of us. Our little girl, Stephanie, she's not so little now, amen, but our littlest one, Stephanie, who was about a year and a half, two years old at that time, had just been bitten in the face by a rabid dog and was going through all the rabies shots. Our other daughter, Dawn, had a, a staph infection that had taken her entire body. And I remember crawling, literally crawling. I couldn't walk. I was so weak. I crawled to the quote unquote living room of our home and I looked out over that mountain. And I remember as I looked out over that mountain, I said, oh God, why God? We've, we've left home. We've left family. And God, we've come here to serve you and to do a work for you. But God, why? And it was just like the sweet Holy Spirit said, why not? Why not? You know, God will test you. God will prepare you. Look what he done for Job. When he tested Job, he let the devil work in Job's life. He let the devil take his riches. He let the devil take his health. But he never let the devil take his life because the life and death is in the hand of my father. Amen. In the hand of my father. And I thank God for that. But he allowed Job to go through the valley. Why? Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth. He had a relationship with God. But after the valley, after the trial, he had a walk with God. He said, that now mine eye has seen. He got to see God for what he was. Folks, if you're going through a valley, it's time to rise up. You know what? Because in the valley is where the lily of the valley is at and the rose of Sharon. But so many times we overlook the beauty of the valley because of circumstances that surround us. 
Paul had circumstances surrounding him, but he overcome the circumstances. He overcome the circumstances. He rose up for the disciples, for the souls, and he rose up for the skeptics. There's those around us watching to see what you have if it's real. They just want to know. You know, in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 21 and continuing, it talks about how God took Ezekiel to the plain of life and how there God tried him and God prepared him that he might be a witness. And when he went through all the trials of that life and the preparation, then God said to him, go say to them, thus saith the Lord God. When you go through the valley, you get out the other side, you can look back and you say, thus saith the Lord God. My family, we have prayed since day one. God help us to understand the needs of our people. You know what the needs of our people are? Somebody that understands their suffering. You know how we understand their suffering? By going through it. By going through it. I'll never forget in the early 90s, was it 91 or 92, dear, you got so sick? 93. 1993, my wife came down with typhoid fever, malaria, dysentery, a scariest worm, several other parasites. She got down to 98 pounds, paralyzed on the whole left side of her body. And I remember as a, we got an official letter from the government ordering us out of the country because they didn't want my wife to die in the country. And I remember carrying my precious wife. She couldn't walk. I carried her to that old 1942 DC-3 airplane that we fly in and out on. And I remember looking back and I thought to myself am I going to come back by myself without the one that I love but God was so gracious God was so gracious he spared my wife's life I'll never forget all that we went through but God spared her life God spared it for a reason because after that was the embargo that was put upon our country in Haiti and we buried 8 to 10 people a week that died of starvation that died of typhoid because there was no medicine there was no food malaria children little children pick them up today bury them tomorrow brother I buried the same coffin three times in one week but see preacher we understood that we understood Paul had to rise up over the problems for the disciples for the souls and for the skeptics old preacher I had a, two missionaries I'll not say who they are well, my wife was so sick, they came out to the house and they said, Brother Bob, you just give us the keys to your home and we'll take care of it. And I thought, well, that's really nice. We no sooner had left the ground of Haiti and they went out to our home and they called in all the preachers that I was training and all the pastors that had been graduated from the college and they said, now listen, Brother Johnston's never coming back. Sister Mary died. They said, you just come and collaborate with us and we'll take care of you. But I thank God that I've trained our men not to look to a man, but to look to a Savior, amen? A risen Savior, a holy God, a righteous and just God. And one of the men said, sir, you may give us more money. I don't pay a preacher. That's the church's job, amen? I teach our churches to tithe. I teach them to give offerings. I teach them to give to faith promise missions. We've got four, we got the home missionaries, seven home missionaries. We're still praying for a foreign missionary and the church is over there to send them, not American money. But I remember he said, told that missionary, he said, our pastor taught us to trust God, not man. We got word, preacher, what they had done. This is when my wife was so sick. We got on that old DC-3, headed back, got special permission for 10 days for my wife to go. And I will never forget this. As we were going back, it says here, and when they had preached the gospel, they had went to Derby and to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, but they went back to the very place and I remember as we were going back, there's no electricity where we live over there. We have never had running water up until recently. We capped the spring up on the mountain. Well, we had running water. We ran down the river every day, filled our barrels. Amen. But I remember as we pulled in, we come over the mountain of Pillbow Wall, and we dropped down in the village of Edre. As we pulled into Edre, everybody thought that my wife was dead. Everybody thought that we weren't coming back, but everybody knew my hat. I wore a hat, amen? Indiana Jones type hat. And as I pulled in, they said, Ça c'est Pastor Obe, oui. Ça c'est Madame Pastor Obe, oui. Guala Jésus, guala Jésus. Y'a du vivant toujours. Jésus tout puissant, Jésus tout puissant. 
They said, that's preacher, that's preacher's wife. Jesus is all powerful and he still answers prayer. And I'll never forget as we drove up that mountain. It was like ants coming off that hillside. They come down off that hillside. My wife got out of the car. They picked her up and they lifted her up. They said, oh God, thank you. They gave her to God. I'll never forget it. I don't want to forget it. See, you don't know what he'll do if you go back. Reinforce your strength. See, Paul rose up and then Paul returned. And he went back to the very same place. The very same place. Folks, there's some on. Oh, listen. I've been struck by lightning on the mission field. Had to learn how to walk again. Had to learn how to talk again. Had to learn how to use my hands again to be able to ride and stuff. But God is so gracious. It went in my shoulder, blew out my foot. They told me that I should have been dead. But grace be to God, I'm here today. I'm here today. Because his mercies are far greater. His mercies are far greater. We serve a living God. We serve a living God. Then look what Paul did. He not only rose up for the disciples, the souls, and the skeptics, but when he returned, he returned to the same place with the same message and the same desire. Gotta go back. I visited my daddy 10 years before he got saved. I was on deputation preacher in Ravenna, Ohio. My wife and I had been fasting and praying for my daddy for 10 days, begging God for his soul. After 10 years, on that 10th day of Wednesday, I was supposed to preach that night in a new church for support. I went to that preacher. I said, preacher, I'm sorry. I got to leave. He said, brother Bob, what's the matter? I told him how God had burdened our hearts and to go back home and to witness to my daddy. He said, brother Bob, you just take my car and leave your kids here. You and your wife go. We left, amen. They didn't have church Wednesday night. They had church Wednesday and Friday night. We got back Friday and we still preached, amen. But I remember I walked into my home. My daddy had told me time and time and time again, you're welcome into this house, but don't you bring that book with you. He meant the Bible. And every time I crossed the threshold of that house, it was just this precious book in my hand. Oh, our visit wouldn't be long, but I'd plant a seed. But this day was so different. Got there about noon, and my daddy, we were farmers all our life. And my daddy was sitting at the table at noon. Most farmers don't miss a noon meal, amen. I walked in that house, and my daddy said, I've been waiting for you. He said, I've been waiting for you. I sat down, and in 15 minutes, I had the privilege, brother, of opening that precious book and showing him how that the Jesus loved him and Jesus died for him and Jesus paid his sin debt and how he was a wicked, wretched sinner in need of a Savior. And within 15 minutes, my daddy got saved. I've led my mama to the Lord. My wife led two of my sisters to the Lord. I led the other one to the Lord. God has been so gracious. God has been so gracious, but it would not have happened if we hadn't returned to the same place with the same message and the same desire. Then lastly, lastly, Paul says this, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Paul went back, he rose up, he returned, and now he's reinforcing. He's reinforcing. Do you know what your trials will do for you? It'll give you a witness to encourage somebody along the way. To encourage somebody along the way. I'll never forget, was it 93 where we were hijacked on the airplane, dear? 94. In February, I forget, I'm, I'm terrible. I may look like a Pentium 4 with a 4, uh, with a, uh, what's that big uh, computer chip now, you know, motherboard, 2.3 gig or something like that. I'm still a 286 motherboard, amen? I just got a pretty box around me. That's my wife, amen? But I remember it happening so clearly. We got on the plane. This is when we had gone back when my wife was so sick. We got on that old DC-3 to come home. We had just sat down on the plane and all of a sudden, kabang! I looked at my wife and said, boy, isn't that just our luck, a flat tire? 
It wasn't a flat tire. It was a hijacker who shot the gun off in the plane. And he hijacked the airplane and we took off not knowing that he had shot out the main communication radio and had cut, cut the uh, cable to the, uh, whatever you call that thing on the back of the air, the tail of the airplane, amen? What do you call that, brother? You're laughing, amen? <laughs> the thing that's supposed to guide the airplane. But bless God, we had an old, an old time uh, Vietnam veteran pilot, amen? He knew how to fly that thing without engines, amen? I mean, he was good. <laughs> amen. And we got up into the air. And I remember sitting in that seat and he stood right here in front of me with a 357 Magnum pointing at my face. And I seen him shake it and I thought to myself, this is it. I could see the hollow points. I could count the chambers on the gun. And I remember as I sat there, I thought, now Lord, is this, what it's, is this gonna, how it's going to end? We got up in the air and he said he wanted to go to Miami. At least he was going the right way, amen. And, uh, but he, didn't, he wanted to go nonstop. That old DC-3 didn't have enough fuel to make it nonstop. So they came and they asked me to translate. My wife and I were the only two that spoke Creole fluently on the airplane. I began to speak to the man. I said, sir, we can't go straight to Miami. We have to go to Grand Turk Island to put fuel in the airplane. He said, no, it's a trap. He said, we're going to Miami. We talked for about 15 minutes. And I finally, I said, sir, I said, can you swim? Haitians are scared to death of water. Just smell them. Hey, Amen. They're scared to death of water. <laughs> hey, Amen. I remember we had our first vehicle. Had air conditioning. I was going to show them what air conditioning was. We didn't get an eighth of a mile down the road and that was over. We rolled all the windows down. Hey, Amen. <laughs> hey, Amen. Well, you got to realize the culture in which they live. They don't have a hot shower. They don't have running water. It's go down to the stream and jump in. But anyway, I remember uh, I told him, I asked him if he could swim, and he said, no. I said, well, we're all going swimming if we can't go land. He said, well, you know, we ought to go over there and get some fuel. I said, you're being pretty smart. We landed in, actually it was Provo, wasn't it? Landed in Provo, a British-controlled island in the Bahamas. We landed there to fuel up. The British government would not give us clearance to take off. The man become hysterical. There's a point that a Haitian goes over and he loses control of his, uh, of his faculties. And there he began to run up and down the aisle and he began to wave this gun around. And I told the pilot, I don't care what you have to do. Get this plane off the ground. Somebody's going to die. That old pilot started up that airplane and we headed out against the orders of the British government. Got up in the air and it had been about five and a half, six hours by this time. And my wife being so spiritual, <laughs> she's going, no. <laughs> said, honey, ask him if I can go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, witness to him. And I said, sir, I don't even know your name and we'd been talking for over five hours. He said, my name is Edwa. I said, sir, my name is Brother Bob Johnston. I said, sir, would it be all right if the people moved about the plane? I said, no one's going anywhere. And he let the people start moving about the plane. There was an ex-Marine sitting right in front of us, and he had told my wife and I he was going to take this man out. But who knows what could have happened if he had started shooting inside that old DC-3. And I remember asking that ex-Marine, sir, would you please move to my amazement he did I had Edwa sit down by the window I sat right beside him I said Edwa I said did you notice that uh, none of us were hysterical when you hijacked the plane he said yeah he said I don't understand it I said because we have a comforter his name's the Holy Spirit I said and Edwa you're going into new waters and you're going into an area where you're going to need that comforter and for what I thought was just a few minutes, they told me it was like a half hour, 45 minutes. I sat there and I gave him scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And after that period of time, he bowed his head and he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. I said, Edward, you know, it'd be a whole lot better for you if you didn't have that gun. When we landed, he looked at me and he said, I trust you. And he handed me the gun. I took it up to the pilot and the co-pilot. When I gave it to them, I thought we was going in a nosedive and we were going to die. They were both in shock that I had the gun and they both reached for it and let go of the controls of the airplane. Bless God we made it, amen. You say, do you think he really got saved? I went back, sat down beside him, prayed a little bit with him. And he turned to me and he said, preacher, would you translate for me? I said, Ed, well, I'd be glad to. He stood up in front of that airplane and he said, folks, I just got saved. 
He said, can you forgive me for what I've done? We had revival on that airplane, preacher. The lady that he had shot between her legs and missed her, the hole went through her skirt and down in through the belly of that airplane and shot out the radio. She come running from the back of the airplane, grabbed him and said, I forgive you. We had revival on that airplane. You don't think that reinforced the saints? I went back to Haiti and I told the people what God had done. You know what our people said? <laughs> That's my God. Is he your God tonight? Is that the kind of God that you have that can take you through the valleys and bring you out rejoicing on the other side? Oh, if I told you all that we've been through. In 95, my family was attacked. Ten commandos came in and shot our home all to pieces. Midnight Christmas Eve. My wife and I crawled through the house. At that time, our oldest daughter, Dawn, was married. And we crawled through the house, and we got, found our son and our daughter laying in the hallway, and we got between a wall, and we laid there and watched as they shot our home to pieces. And we just got a tin roof and block walls. looks like a long house trailer. And for over three hours, they held us. They separated me from my family, took me to an outbuilding, and I remember... As I stood there, they put the 357 to my head. They said, we have to kill you. I said, beans, you're going to kill me. Can you at least tell me why? They said, we're getting paid to do this. Six weeks prior to this, the Catholic Church wrote a letter and nailed it to the door of our church saying that I was preaching a heresy and they were going to do whatever they deemed necessary to stop me from preaching this heresy. They were mad because the Catholic church in the area where we was preaching used to run over 500 and now was running barely 100. Not because I preached against a Catholic religion. I don't do that. But because of door knocking, because of witnessing, and because of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, these people have been saved. Amen. And as he stood there with that gun to my head, a gun went off in my house. And I seen little tin lift up on the roof of my house. It was those old M1s, preacher, 30 out sixes. They had sawed off shotguns like they used for security. They had handguns. Picked up 246 30 out six rounds alone out of my front yard after it was over. But I remember standing there and I said, when that gun went off in the house, I said to myself, now was that my wife, my son, or my daughter? At that very moment, a vehicle came up the road. Now you say, why is that so important? Well, they had commandos below our house. They had commandos above our house blocking the road. Nobody could get through. But this vehicle just showed up out of nowhere. It had lights all over it coming up the road. And they started hollering, it's the American military. It was during the occupation. They said, it's the American military. And they took off and left us standing there. After it was all over, went out to the road. I was asking the people, where'd that truck come from? They said, preacher, we've never seen it before. Had rain that night, preacher. The only tire tracks that was there was the tracks of the, of the commando's vehicle. The other vehicle didn't leave any tracks. They said, preacher, do you know where the vehicle came from? I said, I know where it come from, and I know who's driving it. <laughs> God spared us. Now, it wasn't without sorrows, because when they separated me from my family, they held my precious little girl and my son at gunpoint and made them witness as they defiled their mother before them. But I thank God for my wife who rose up over the circumstance, who returned and still has the same vision, the same desire, the same goal of seeing Haiti and the Haitian people come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But my question for you tonight is this. What are you willing to pay for Oliver Springs, Tennessee? What are you willing to pay that your neighbor might be saved? What are you willing to pay that those grandchildren might be saved? Paul rose up, he returned, and he reinforced can you imagine what a shouting fit it was at Iconium when he walked back in the second time and they seen it was worth living for. Not only worth dying for, but worth 
living for. You know, John tells us, Jesus speaking there, but John penned down. In John 14, greater things than these shall thou do. And I said, Lord, what's the greater thing? I can't be an Apostle Paul. Oh, I desire to be, but I can't be an Apostle Paul. I, I want to be a witness, God. I want to have a testimony, God, like the apostles, the saints of old. But God, I know I lack. So God, what's the greater thing? God said, live for me. Live for me. What's Romans 12, 1 say? Paul said, I beseech you. That's beg, cry, plead. What's he beseeching us to do? But to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Tonight, are you willing to pay the price for others, preacher? Tonight, I'd like everybody to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to ask you a question. I know tonight, I really don't want a song, brother, if that's not a problem. We need a song in our heart. Amen. A lot of people use that songbook for a crutch. But tonight, I want to ask you a question. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. I won't start until I see that because this is a private time. Everybody, I'm looking around to see if everybody's head's bowed. How many here tonight would say, Brother Bob, I know that I'm a child of the King. Blood-bought, born-again Christian. Lift your hands high as a testimony. Amen. High. Don't be ashamed. Looks like virtually everybody here is a child of the King. You can put them down. There were a few hands that couldn't be raised. I know tonight's message was not a salvation type message. But it talked about the God and a Savior of that salvation. And just as the lives of these Haitians have been changed. You can be changed. We've seen five witch doctors come to know Christ. as their personal Lord and Savior. You say my sins are too great. Your sins can't be greater than that. To be sold to the devil and delivered for eternity. Is there one here tonight that would say, Brother Bob, would you pray for me? I'd sure like to know this Jesus that can change a life. An uplifted hand. Amen. Amen. An uplifted hand tonight. Christian, did God speak to you tonight? If God spoke to your heart, just lift your hand up tonight. Did God challenge you, encourage you, strengthen you all over the auditorium tonight? Hands are going up. Don't look around and see who's raising their hand. You look at your own heart. The singing was to prepare you for the preaching. The preaching was to prepare you for the ultimate worship. And that's down here at an old-fashioned altar. If God spoke to your heart, He wants to hear from your heart tonight. As the pianist plays... Would you come tonight? Would you come and let God have His will and His way in your life? People are already coming. How about you? People are already coming. How about you? Maybe you say, well, Brother Bob, I can't kneel down at the altar. My knees are bad. Well, you know God's right there where you're at. But don't let that hinder you coming. Don't let that hinder you from praying. You can bow down right there where you're at. You say, Brother Bob, it's unreal what I heard tonight. I can't believe it all. You don't have to believe me. But I'm asking you to believe His Word. The time has come for us to make a decision. Are we going to be the witness that God wants us to be? Is Oliver Springs, Tennessee worth the price? Is it worth the price to you? Folks have come, how about you? Don't let the devil rob you tonight. Let he have his will and his way. If Jesus was to come tonight, would he be satisfied? Would you be satisfied in what he found? 
People are still coming. Will you come? God's moving. He wants to move in you. Let Him have His way with you tonight. How about you? How about you? Maybe God's been dealing with you about full-time ministry and you've been fearful. It's time to step out. I can say from experience that God is faithful. Your preacher can say from experience that God is faithful. Will you just give your life to God and let Him have His way with you? It costs something. It costs something. Let Him have His way with you. Amen. Amen. People still praying? The opportunity still here for you? Did you mean it when you raised your hand you said God spoke to you? You know, I... I'm usually not a long-winded person when it comes to invitation. When I preach what God tells me to preach and the Holy Spirit works in your heart, you're responsible to respond. Before God, have you done what God put on your heart to do tonight? Let Him have His will. Let Him have His way with you. wait just for a moment please listen closely going through hard times should have got some help tonight shouldn't you facing impossible situations We've got some help tonight, shouldn't we? If you never trusted Christ, you ought to do so tonight. We'd be glad to meet you here. Take the word of God, show you how you can be saved, how you can know it. If you've been saved, but you've never been baptized, <clears throat> if you wish to get baptized tonight, I want you to come. Either you come now, or if you need to set a time to get baptized, I want you to come. If you've never been baptized, you ought to, something you ought to do. You need to get baptized tonight, you come. If you're going to get sitting at a time, need to set a time to get baptized, you come. If this is the church family, you'll be a part of this church family. I want to encourage you to come. They're going to play for us. Okay. Brother Keith, why don't you baptize for me tonight because I'm going to do something else. You need to come. We'll wait just a moment longer. Just a moment longer. You need to come. And everything you need to do. <clears throat> Someone feel the call to go to Haiti? Be seated, please. The gentleman getting baptized tonight got saved this morning. Came the first time to our church this morning, was saved this morning, getting baptized. That's wonderful, isn't it? The Johnson, thank you. Thank you for your family. 
Travis, why don't you come and help me lay this down here? In fact, why don't you just lay it down? Brother George Austin, Brother George, as preacher told you, came this morning for the very first time. And God spoke to his heart and he got saved. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Amen. And tonight he's following the Lord in believer's baptism. It's a great privilege of ours to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, risen and walking in newness of life. Amen. Amen. What George did is very important, isn't it? Amen. It certainly is important to him. I'm going to do something I don't feel worthy of doing. But I feel like I just want to do it. I'm going to ask the Pat, Brother Johnson, if you and your wife and your daughter will come and just kneel here. And uh, as a church family, let's gather around them and let's pray for them and pray for their work there. And ask God to bless them. And as we're praying, let's give thanks for them. Amen. Just kneel right there. We're going to gather, gather around to the church now. Just come around, folks. Kneel somewhere on the front row. Well, Johnson, come up here a second. <clears throat> what did you tell? You said you were building something. What are you building? Bible college. A Bible college. Yes, sir. What do you, how much? Tell. I don't, you didn't mention much about it. What it cost and all that. What well, do you need? 
to finish the first phase? Yes. We need eighteen thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Tell us tell us more about it. Well, the Bible College, I believe, is the future of the ministry. This fall, if we can get the first phase of the building done, we'll have two hundred and thirty three new students coming in this fall. We will house what we can, but we can't house them all at this time until we get that building done. And I believe that as, uh, with, as the college gets going, I'm now jumping from church to church to church, preaching in, in insta teaching in institutes, and it's taken me upwards of five years to t do a three-year course. But if I can get these men focused in one area to where I can teach them daily, minister to them and help them, get them involved in the ministry locally, to prepare them to send them back to Haiti, over to the Dominican, I'm already asking God to call missionaries out. Uh, and like in Jamaica, there's 1.2 million Haitians. Nobody's working with them. Trinidad, seven, over 700,000 in one nucleus. No one working with them. In the Bahamas, there's over a million. And I know of only one missionary over there working with the Haitian people. And I'm asking God to call out Haitians to be sent out by the local churches that we've started. Of the 18 churches we've started, there's 36 churches that exist today. And I praise the Lord for that. But we need missionaries. We need men trained that we can go on and I believe within three years uh, conservatively we'll be starting 50 new churches a year mm. on the mission field mm. so I believe this is the vital part like I said the ministry and the future of that ministry is not me but it's these men that will be training that will take up the helm and carry on Amen. I believe we can do something don't you all think we can do something We'll talk with our folks and praise the Lord. We'll do something. We'll praise the Lord. And I want to do something besides something. You know what I'm saying? I want to do I want something above something. I want to do something. I believe we can do that. You folks believe we can do that? Amen. Yeah. The good news is the money is there. The bad news is it's still in your pockets. <laughs> right? <laughs> My wife told me when Brother Johnson started, he said, I think we found somebody who can talk faster than you can. <laughs> With the Larry, over going. Mm -mm. Uh, I, was, I was tired watching him. <laughs> Which wife goes over to the table? <laughs> Go back to the table. <laughs> Brother George is standing here on the left as you leave tonight. Shake hands with him. Rejoice with him. Tell him you're grateful for the decision he made. When you tell, when you tell three or four folks you love them, you're at liberty to leave tonight. Be sure and go by the table where the Johnstons are. Thank you. <laughs>